This is the Daniel Shea's Bookshelf audio cast number two. And I thought that today I would begin with a quote. The quote is from a book called Credit Civilization from a series called Great Ages of Man, a very old book. I think the copyright might have been, I believe, 1967, somewhere around there. And this is uh, all about the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia, in ancient, even perhaps prehistoric times, really, I suppose, uh, Samaria, ancient Samaria. And most people, when they think about democracy and the beginnings of democracy and where it first developed, I, I, I would suspect that most people think of Athens. But uh, there were democracies, apparently, according to this book, long before Athens, long before Athens. And uh, apparently they were very decentralized and they were run on sort of the village or city level. And the people had a lot of input. At least that's the picture this book seems to paint. And so I want to read this quote about what happened to their democracy. Quote, Unable to cope with such military threats, the democratic decision-making assemblies that had survived since the days of the village found it necessary to select one of their most capable and courageous citizens to lead them to victory over the enemy. And so the institution of kingship was born. Let me read that part again. And so the institution of kingship was born. At first the appointment of a big man, that's in quotes in the book, for that is the literal meaning of Lugal. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The Sumerian word for king was temporary and its authority was limited. But as one conflict bred another, the role, keep in mind it says the role, not the thing itself, but the role, the role of king lost its transitory character and became hereditary, dynastic, and despotic. Well, 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 well. Look at the role of the kings throughout history. Look at the role of our presidents. And some people will talk about the imperial presidency. And uh, certainly not the intent of the founding fathers of the Constitution who were looking back to I think what they saw as the Roman Republic in, in perhaps ancient Greece and they actually weren't entirely fans of democracy uh, either they wanted to have uh, the rights of the minority protected and, and I had tend to agree with those who would suggest I, I've, I've heard others Noam Chomsky sometimes would quote James Madison talking about the um, was it the minority of the opulent you know and how democracy is a threat basically to, to these to, to the minority of the opulent opulent I, I I suppose so there's lots of ways to view this certainly it is important to have the rights of the minority the minority protected from the majority who could be an ugly mob it's possible 
at the same time, I think it's been a bit overdone as to what the founders had in mind when they when they talked about the minority and I think they meant them I think they meant their wealth and their power and their privilege just my and the Constitution is a great document especially certain parts of it especially the Bill of Rights and I, and I tend to think Jefferson would disagree with a lot of the other but he spent a lot of time not being around. He's been, in fact, he spent a lot of time in France, from what I understand. Um, you know, at the very nascent early stages of the French Revolution. And so. This is a bit of a digression, but here we are in the 21st century with an imperial presidency, as some would see it, the role, I'm not talking about the person within the presidency, I'm talking about the role of the president with a Congress that is meaningless, and the idea, of course, is to have perpetual war as some have suggested look at the book 1984 you know they had to be at war with somebody and it, and it seemed to me didn't didn't matter that the, the the names kept changing of the of the enemy that the enemy was one day there and and then it went down the memory hole and then there's still at war but it didn't seem to click to the the masses. I think he even called them the proles, Orwell did, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's an old game, and I have the quote right here, and so some guy figured out if we can keep the people at war, I can be king, and my family can uh, rule, and this war is a good racket, is what they figured out. And they figured it out I want to say that was like 5,000 years ago. I think that's the time frame this, this book is, is speaking of, like roughly 5,000 years ago. Maybe maybe more. Maybe more. Maybe I'm, I'm off by a, who knows, a thousand years here, a thousand years there. But we're talking about quite some time ago that there was democracy and it was ruined because people found out certain people were able to manipulate the masses into thinking that they needed to cope with a threat and when that turned into a, and maybe it was a real threat of course at first but then after that in order to maintain their power and their prestige, their privilege, there had to always be a threat. So the second quote that I'm going to read is from Plato, from his Republic which some people say, you know, he must have been kidding because who would want to live in a, a place like he's describing in his Republic? By the way, I d never could figure out what bugged me about these guys like Plato and Socrates until, until one day I saw a philosopher whose name I've forgotten on, on C-SPAN, I think it was, and he said Plato was, was an enemy of democracy. So there you go. And so was Socrates. I think they had their reasons. And part of it might have been, from my interpretation, the war with Sparta. And they might have blamed the war with Sparta on the masses, the mob, as they were to see it. And on democracy. We had that, the, the, historical Pericles who was 
a leader of the of the people but for the way I understand it also a, a military man and and you did have the war with Sparta ongoing during well during Socrates time at least I'm not certain about into the time of Plato it was a long war from what I understand and I'm not so certain if they were correct in blaming the people. Probably the people were being manipulated by some of some of the elites, at least originally. Although it's good to be able to blame the people when when you're when you can't win your war, when you finally come up against someone like Sparta, a country like Sparta, a city state like Sparta, that's able to counter you. And again, I see a lot of parallels, just like with the last quote, to things going on today. So, in his Republic, he said, Plato said, quote, no one, he's talking about the elite, first of all. So when he says no one, he means the elite. No one must have any private property whatsoever except what is absolutely necessary. Secondly, no one must have any lodging or storehouse at all which is not open to all comers. They must live in common. They alone of all in the city dare not have any dealings with gold or silver or even touch them. I, I left parts of the quote out, but that's the gist of it. Now imagine that. Imagine that. As far as I know, Plato was the first, there may, there may have been someone before him, but it's the first that I've come across, the first person who really promoted this idea of the, the philosopher king, you know, the benevolent autocrat that uh, watches over his people and is interested in philosophy and this sort of thing, but and is a ruler perhaps even absolute but nonetheless is very benevolent and um, intelligent and knows how to rule in a way that uh, benefits his people and I think that was what Plato really the idea the concept that he really liked although the Republic is if you if you try to read through the Republic, it gets it's very it's, it doesn't sound like any word that you'd really want to. Or as far as I can tell, that you know, it doesn't sound like a place you'd really want to live in, and you wonder if he was putting you on with parts of it. If he was just kidding. Although I I, I don't know, I've I've had philosophers say no, he was really serious about it, and this part here sounds very r rational. And reasonable. One other thing I wanted to talk about that I've been quite aware of for some time is this concept of predictive programming because I came across a few mm, examples I guess of predictive programming or supposed alleged predictive programming recently that I'd been aware of but I'd never seen the actual clips I came across the the actual television and, uh, and movie clips it's the television clip that stands out in my mind the most uh, two of them really for for someone who's not familiar with the concept of predictive programming the reasons why it would be done I'm not going to go into because that that would uh, take too much time Maybe I'll give one reason before I even give the definition. One reason is it might really simply be the elite, if you believe there's an elite. Certainly many people do, and there's lots of evidence for it. And we have people like Edward Bernays many, many years ago talking about how to control the the public and so on and so forth, and you can look that up. So... I think probably more likely it's the elite speaking amongst themselves giving messages to each other because they they don't all agree they don't all agree on everything but for whatever reason 
there's this concept of predictive programming and what it is is that the elite will use their fictional media like movies like television maybe maybe books things like that definitely video games and one video game stands out in my mind and if, uh, maybe I'll talk about that too momentarily to uh, show you at least what they're planning on doing and and I think these people might maybe they they think too much of themselves they think that they have more that they can accomplish more than they're capable of that they have more power than they really do perhaps I could be wrong because not all their plans that are shown in the predictive programming seem to materialize in the way that they seem to be suggesting that they should so what they do is they'll show you little and make it not so overt make it sort of not really covert either but little little things they'll show you um, plots in a in a television show plots in a movie things that'll be said things that'll be very strange and odd within the movie that then later on something will happen and it'll be similar or even just like what was being talked about or shown in the movie and 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 the reason i tend to believe the concept of predictive programming is because is because i've 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 seen i've seen too much evidence to to ignore it i suppose although i'm not entirely sold that it is always uh, well, let me start with the one that didn't work out for them. Them being whomever, whoever was behind this particular agenda. Because, as I said, they, they seem not all to agree. There was a video game that uh, came out that before the war that the Russians fought in Georgia. And I mean Georgia that's connected to you know the old what the old soviet georgia is what the, the georgia i mean not the one that's in the south of the united states and um well there was a video game where they were fighting in that very special forces or, or some such thing fighting in that very same area south of Setia, you know okay abkhazia and then later on i don't remember the exact time frame could have been months it could have been years the war broke out but but it didn't really go the way that it, it would seem to you know that the video game would seem to suggest it should have gone because uh, i think that uh, the russians in particular vladimir putin had other ideas and decided that no this video game is not really correct and so everyone knows the outcome of the 2008 war between should know at least I shouldn't have to explain that and the Russians are still as far as I know they're still in South Ossetia, South Ossetia and the end of Kasia which uh, Georgia uh, basically a satellite of the US Empire as I tend to call it a proxy you had controlled those areas before or tried to control them there was a lot of low intensity I guess violence and this sort of thing going on before so the Russians came in and, and, and as far as I know they're, they're still there that example of predictive programming shows that these people do not uh, really run the entire world even though it might seem like they do i can at least point to one example where where if if there is predictive programming and and that was that certainly looks very suspicious to have that video game come out and have it be the very area where the war breaks out anyway so let's put that one aside. The ones I came across recently were ones of videos that I saw on YouTube. There's a channel called 
expose 777 that has a lot of good videos but you could just type it into the YouTube search engine and until someone says copyright or something forces these little clips offline everywhere that they are you should be able to find them one of them is in the Simpsons from many years before 9-11 occurred I think 1997 the uh, episode aired and and it's when the Simpsons are gonna go to New York City I guess and so Lisa Simpson has this brochure all of a sudden she pulls this brochure out and shoves it right in what would be the you know the camera right in our in our faces on the television and it says nine dollars and right next to the nine dollars are the twin towers it looked like an eleven and then Bart Simpson pulls out a wad of money and points at this with this big wad of money and it's just bizarre it's just bizarre to, to watch and maybe I'm not my description doesn't do it justice but if you were to see it yeah it's just shocking it's, it really is shocking in a way to see that and to know especially now looking back knowing you know what happened on 9-11 and perhaps that it's difficult to say because as I said that that came out in 1997 so maybe who knows what the there you know there are stranger things as Shakespeare said than than uh, can be shown in your philosophy or some such thing you know the world is not as um, cut and dry as some would like to to make it out to be and you know maybe maybe it is a coincidence but what a coincidence so an even bigger coincidence which some point to is predictive programming there was an episode that was like a spin-off I guess of um, uh, of an X-Files I think it was an X-Files spin-off and uh, it, it didn't have any of the famous people as far as I could see from the X-Files it had some other actor that I didn't even know but the whole print and it came out in March of I believe 2001 I think so it came out before 9-11 either way but the whole show was how they were going to st well to a few people the main character the character that would be what's his name David Duchovny but it wasn't David Duchovny it was this other guy was going to basically stop someone from flying uh, airplanes uh, you know, into the middle of New York City, and I and I believe they even mentioned, they even mentioned the Twin Towers. It was very, very freaky, very freaky to watch this and and to see them talking about this in this fictional movie, and, and even the whole idea of you know that some people suggest the more conspiratorial minded among us of flying the planes by remote control and the guy even asks I'm not sure if the older man is supposed to be the president or just somebody who's very important but he asked the older man you know why would the government want to blah 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 he says you know and the older man says there you go again the government well it's not the government there the government isn't one entity basically he has to explain to him there are a lot of different people doing different things and then he goes on to say that defense spending has been very you know the profits have been very flat or some such thing as that and uh, so then the 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 younger one the one that is the main character the, the sort of the detective type government detective type he says so this is all about uh, you know defense spending money making money off the defense industry and he's astounded wouldn't surprise me if it was I bet you it was about a lot of things and who knows what really happened 
the government's story is very difficult to accept as time goes on but that's very strange very strange a, a third one I remember is some really cheesy B movie on I think it was like on Fox or something and it was all about the crazy weather happening and how there was a, a program and we know there is a program it's called HARP and people can look into it I, there's different they admit that HARP exists they just won't give you the exact details of what it is and many many people think it has to do with weather manipulation at least and other countries can do it too and, and you can go look this up it goes back as far I mean this technology is not new it goes back as far as Nikola Tesla a hundred years ago or more Nikola Tesla had been uh, working on things to affect the weather and and, and even more go look up Tesla and you'll, and you'll see Nikola Tesla but anyway it, it looked as though well first of all you never saw the president but it obviously wasn't Bush the 2008 elections hadn't happened yet I don't think the president is sort of this character that's always there but they never really show him and it seems like they were inferring that the president was opposed to this program continuing and it was sort of a rogue general or someone who was continuing on with the program despite the fact that uh, people thought it was very dangerous certain and, and again it was like factional infighting within this at the same time all the weather was going crazy tornadoes tsunamis the whole everything that that uh, people who talk about harp talk about and that many people believe we've seen whether it's true or not believe we've seen more of and what we often hear about in relation to the year 2012 you know the whole idea of earthquakes and um, <laughs> you know all the rest of it so that's another one that I noticed I, I also noticed an instance of what could be called predictive programming within a, a movie within the first Sherlock Holmes movie but I, I just don't want to speak about it because I can't remember I wouldn't be able to articulate it well enough I just just go watch the first Sherlock Holmes movie and you'll see a point where he looks directly into the camera and it's very odd what he says and Robert Downey Jr. who was playing Sherlock Holmes so the only other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the ongoing chaos the ongoing war or Arab Spring slash you know uh, democracy spreading smash slash oh I said smash <laughs> like a Freudian thing slash humanitarianism of the great wonderful West you know but it looks like the Russians uh, for now have stopped a NATO attack at least on Syria but these are very dangerous times alright thank you